Integrate Yourself podcast with Allison Pillow and Maya Gottlieb. My name is Maya. Allison is here with me, and we have a wonderful guest. His name is Brian Thomas. He is from Colorado, and he is a Z Health practitioner, which he refers to himself as a neurology performance consultant. And why he has come on our show is he's going to give us some information of why he has passionately become involved with learning more about the brain, what the brain is doing when you are working out, and why it's important for your own knowledge of what is going on with you in your body and how it is reflecting in your nervous system. So welcome to the show, Brian. Glad to be here. This is exciting. So one of the first questions I wanted to know is what really gave you the edge to jump into Z Health? So I discovered Z Health completely on a whim. I had been a personal trainer off and on for about 12 years at the time and was looking into getting certified in kettlebell training. So I was looking at options with the RKC. I was looking at options with Strong First, IKFF. And a lot of them have a physical testing component to them. You have to go to the course and you have to spend three days just basically working out for three whole days to learn the technique and then to have a physical component to your testing to show that not only are you able to teach the technique, but you're able to learn it and demonstrate it as well. So in that process, a lot of times people get injured at those certifications. So they highly recommend that you go seek out an RKC or Strong First instructor that can show you the proper way to do things before you get there. So I said, okay, I don't want to get hurt, so I'm going to go do this. In that process, I sought out a guy who was in Denver. He happened to be an, RK, an RKC instructor, but he also had a Z Health certification. And I saw that on his website when I looked him up, and I didn't really pay any attention to it. I said, meh, whatever, Z Health, I don't care. I want kettlebells because that's macho. <laughs> so I'm going to go seek that out. And uh, I linked up with him, went through a uh, little assessment of how I was doing all the movements. And he said, oh, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. We got to my Turkish getup. And for those that aren't familiar, it's an exercise in which you have a kettlebell that you are going from a lying on your back position to standing while holding this kettlebell overhead the whole time. And there's a lot of nuances to it. There's a lot of weird little pieces to it. Going through that exercise, he commented, he said, hey, can you bridge your hips a little bit higher? I said, that's, that's it. That's all I got. Deal with it. <laughs> and <laughs> he took my foot and he grabbed my foot and just kind of opened up one of the joints, just kind of stretched it a little bit, set it back down and said, okay, now try. So I said, okay, that's weird. This guy has a foot fetish. <laughs> So <laughs> I go through, and I go back through the exercise. And sure enough, my hips bridged way better. I felt like I shot my pelvis through the ceiling. It was a noticeably easier movement and far less difficult than I had ever imagined. And I looked at him. I said, okay, what just happened there? Why does that matter? What, what do we just do? And that he said, okay, so we've talked about the differences in RKC. We've talked about the differences in Strong First and IKFF. Let's talk about Z Health. So I said, okay, you've got my attention. So he told me a little bit about it, explained to me how little bits of input can affect so many other things. And at that point, I still didn't know if I wanted to do that, but I looked at their calendar, I looked at their website, saw that they had a course coming up in Denver in about a month. I said, well, I can do kettlebell stuff, or I can go learn the Z Health thing, which I don't really understand or know much about. But as I thought about it, kettlebells would really only help me to be good at kettlebell training people who wanted kettlebell training. The more I thought about it, the more I realized how the neurology would affect anybody, whether they wanted to train with kettlebells or not, the Z Health course seemed like a much better bet. So I went, and in that course, I saw the instructors there. And this was what really moved me to move forward with their curriculum, is every instructor that they had was calm. They were very relaxed in their movement. They were able to move very, very well. And they were very intelligent. And they could do everything that they were explaining. 
and they could explain it in a way that I actually understood, which was really impressive. <laughs> so at that point, I said, these guys are very different in their demeanor and in their attitude and in their presentation than any course I'd ever been to, than any sort of instructors I've ever worked with. I want to be like that. It was one that was full of stress hormones as I was really limiting a lot of the things that were keeping me sane or that would have kept me sane at the time. And as a result, seeing that, I knew instantly that they had that just personality and persona that I wanted. Mm. So I said, I'm going to go pursue this. So I went to their first major course, the R phase course, learned how to move nearly every joint in my body. And at that point, I said, okay, I feel different than I've ever felt. I move better than I've ever moved. This is it. This is my calling because I feel like I'm a completely different person. And that made me want to bestow that gift on other people, too. Wow. Thank you for uh, sharing your story. It's quite passionate. And it really explains the depth of why the when you do start taking some of these courses, it just unravels so many gifts for you and in, in other people that you work with. Allison, do you have anything you want to say? I was curious, Brian, as to how long you've been doing it and how how has it affected your clients? Have you been using it with lots of, of your clients and have you seen many quick results from it? You just kind of throw it in there when you're working with clients in the gym or how does it how does it work? So initially I was so enamored with how something so seemingly simplistic could have such a profound effect on my response or my movement or my strength. So immediately I gravitated towards everybody needs to do this Z health stuff all the time. Right. And what I started to realize the longer I've been doing their courses and I've taken their whole curriculum at this point, some courses several times over and I've been doing it now for about five years. At once I started to really realize that it wasn't about you can only do Z health. It was more a, a lens to look at everything else you're doing things through it made me a lot more precise in using not only the tools that I gleaned from Z Health, but it made me more precise in the application of the tools I had outside of Z Health already. So understand that <coughs> I've been able to integrate it with every client. I do Z Health pretty much exclusively anymore, at least facets of that focus. So by that I mean I'll have clients that I work with that are dealing with chronic pain issues. I'll have clients that I'm working with that are dealing with chronic respiratory issues. Um, I have clients that I work with that simply just want to look better naked. <laughs> and so with that, a lot of what I'll do is things that can get them where they need to go. But I use a lens that allows me to really focus on whether or not they're neurologically going to be a better, happier person when the process is all said and done. And that's yeah. really the big thing for me is seeing those kind of changes on that personal level. Yeah, that's incredible. I, I find most people don't are not even aware that there are neurological benefits that can come about through exercise or activating certain responses in your body neurologically. So, yeah, that's incredible. Hey, hey, you're hearing a lot more people talk about neurology and fitness now. Mm -hmm. And it's really exciting to see, but I think a lot of it falls short of the precision that's really yeah. necessary to make those changes stick for that individual. Yeah, that word is being thrown around a lot right now. I, I totally agree. And and so you're saying the difference between what's being kind of thrown around, neuroscience and that kind of thing is as a as a Z health practitioner, there is a there's a complete system that goes with that and and it's in an assessment as well. Absolutely. Now, yeah. we're all, whether you're using Z Health or you've gone to courses with Z Health or not, if you have a client you're exercising or you have a client you're talking to or you have a client you're working with on a nutritional level, you can't divorce that from their neurology. And so when you look at the tool set that Z Health provides you, it allows you a lens to look at what that client may actually really truly need that may be exclusive to them and no other client or athlete or family member that you're working with. So when you can make things super, super precise, you can see changes quickly, you can see changes that are appropriate to what they need, and you can spare yourself a lot of frustration and a lot of effort 
doing things that may not help them or may make them worse or set them back. Yes, I love that. I, I kind of find it as a individualization or adaptation that kind of can change someone in in in, a, in an amazing way. Is if you just actually just um, take even a small amount, like even just a, a wrist circle or some kind of um, jam finger can change the uh, you know the how the body responds to any movement at all and it really kind of comes down to really seeing that stacking of stress and you know we don't really um, feel the stress but our bodies are carrying it and we may we may not be aware of when we're walking or what we're doing and it seems very normal but then when you start to find that you can't do something then it's like wow oh okay if I just do these, they actually take that stacking down a little, and then I can move a little bit better, which is so awesome. And if I had a dollar for every time a small, seemingly innocuous drill made somebody better, I could buy a small recliner. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you also uh, mentioned how individualizing uh, someone's nutrition. So if someone's coming to you for a nutrition issue, um, maybe they don't even know they have a nutrition issue, but they're coming with you with all their little explanations of what they want, and then you unravel that they have a nutritional need. Um, talk a little bit about that, because we also are very well, um, we're, we're all in the repeat world, um, delving in and out, and uh, we also know um, other Z practitioners that have started doing some of the work with Ray Pete, aka um, Zachariah, and some of the Kate Deering and all them. Tell us a little about your road in the uh, nutrition world with Ray Pete and how that's kind of progressed for you. So I originally came across Ray Pete's work years before I found Z Health, um, and he was mentioned kind of tongue-in-cheek in an insulting kind of way by Jack Cruz. <laughs> so, oh, really? We, his his <laughs> name Cruz, just came up on our last podcast. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jack Cruz had mentioned uh, Ray Pete in one of his articles and said, huh. one of the things Ray Pete gets wrong is blah, 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 blah. Wow. And I said, well, wait a minute. I've never heard that name. I should look this person up. So I looked him up, and at the time that I was uh, first introduced to him, I was following a very – strict Jack Cruz, fish oil, cold thermogenic, ketogenic diet. I didn't feel very good. I didn't fare very well on that. But uh, at that point, that name always stuck with me. So then fast forward a few years, finding Z Health, one of the big things that we talk about is how in order to get a stimulus to be strong enough or last long enough in the brain, you need to have strong metabolic function because if you're trying to fire a neuron that hasn't been fired before, yeah. isn't very often, you need to have enough energy to be able to do that. And so metabolically, there's a lot of things that can play into why somebody may not respond well to a certain activity or a certain right. uh, environment or just in general how their thyroid may function. And that could, of course, affect all sorts of things vitamin and mineral wise as well. So at that point, Having taken a Z Health course, uh, notice a lot of people there drinking milk. I thought, that's weird. <laughs> a lot of people drinking Coke. That's weird. <laughs> I'm a caveman. I'm not supposed to drink that stuff. Or oranges. So, You're eating oranges? Oh, my God. Oranges. Don't you know? Hi, crazy. Hi, um, <laughs> sugar. Hi, sugar. <laughs> I just wanted to proselytize to them and say, hey, you need all this fish oil. Don't you know anything? <laughs> Meanwhile, not being a beacon of health myself, I decided not to say that. Because, you know, once I started to feel better doing the movement, I said, you know what? Maybe there's other things that I don't know yet either. Mm. There's more out there. And maybe I don't have all the answers just yet. Mm. And in that process, in exploring that and talking to these people, come to find out more about Ray Pete's work. And I went out to a friend's house at the time, and he was doing a lot of Ray Pete stuff and Z Health stuff at the same time. And we had decided that he was gonna, I was going to help him study for a course. So we were going to do a lot of anatomy study and muscle testing and things like that and practice a lot of these drills. So he tells me, he says, hey, we're going to have to go to the store because all this work really drains me and I need a lot of fuel. And so at the same time, I'm still paleo, mind you. I'm still ketogenic. 
didn't have that, all the answers. <laughs> and so we go to the grocery store, and he grabs Coke, and he grabs orange juice, and he grabs milk. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, what are you doing? This is crazy. But I like the guy, so I didn't want to be rude. So I went back to his house, and we're sharing Cokes and OJ and all this stuff. I went to bed that night and slept better than I had in years. Oh, wow. Years. Wow. And I woke up and I had energy. I, I to, to spare you guys the gory details, I had an erection. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't had one when I woke up for many years prior to that. Yeah. And at that yeah. point, I said, okay, something has changed because the libido issues I had that keto was supposed yeah. to resolve seemed to go away when I drank sugar. Yeah. Oh, and I yeah. thought to myself, that's odd. Okay. I need to know more about this yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because this is exactly one of the big things I've been missing in my life. Right. So I looked further into it, started reading his website, started reading his articles, sought out some professional coaching from former guest of yours, Zachariah Salazar. <laughs> and uh, I've been working with him ever since, actually. But he's uh, really turned me on to a lot of different ways of thinking about nutrition and the repeat stuff just makes perfect sense when you start piecing it together. Right. Now, a lot of people look at it on one level, and I, what I think is really um, unfortunate for Ray Pete's work and his life of studying this stuff is that a lot of people will fixate very easily on one component of it, whether it's the essential fatty acids, whether it's the sugar, whether it's the hormones, whether it's estrogen. Or the poop. And the kids who... The poofas. What's that? Uh, the poofas, the like poof. they can't eat so, poofa. Yeah. <laughs> and that's and that's exactly it. Is it's it's one of those things where if you look at it not as a set of rules and you yeah. look at it as a set of ideas, as a concept to experiment with for yourself, you can make your own decision. Absolutely. But if you don't even try and you discount it at face value without trying, there's a lot of things that you may be missing out with that. But I don't fault people for that. To be honest with you, I think there's a real strong reason people might do that. And that would come back to the neurology and how we will make decisions for our own survival. And when we're poorly fueled, it's very easy to make decisions without thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very easy to not look at that whole big picture and say, I should research this more. It's very easy yeah. to say, no, no, I heard this at one point, and I don't have the capacity to think any further, so I'm immediately going to reinforce and bolster my opinion. That's that's a really excellent point, Brian, and I um, I think about that a lot, too, and run into a lot of people. I always ask them, why? You know, why are you doing it? Why, do you know why this is, or why you're eating this, or why it's good for you, for, for what reason? Well, no, I don't really know. I'm just doing it because I heard it from someone else, and that's all well and good, but again, you know, you're you're losing your ability for critical thinking. But you know, when it get, comes to the health industry, I think people are really used to being told what to do, yeah, and they just do it because it's healthy. And they're and, <laughs> and they're also yeah. so conditioned into a diet, like, oh, I have this structure that I need to follow so that I can do this thing or goal. And then the problem is there is no diet. There was only the ideas of what you said, ideas of how the body functions better on certain things, on how your you know sugar isn't the, the, the demon that we've made it out to be. There's uh, right. actual reasons for why you have to have it. And, um, and it's sad because I even had, we've had this discussion times and times again where people have tried some version of Ray and then said, oh, that didn't work, or um, it was some kind of cult of some information that was, and his, his, like you said, his body of work is so intense that I think like uh, when we were first starting, Alice and I both had conversations about this where you're just so fatigued and you're trying to learn That's on your sad. own and you don't yeah. know what you're doing and then you have someone try to help you but then they want you to understand everything. So you have to be really kind of diligent and persevere and keep trying for yourself, which brings you back to the self um, helplessness but reversing it to your self authority. That you become your own authority of your health again, which is a real big transition for people. It really is and I, I, I tell my clients this all the time is that if I could bestow upon them one gift, 
it would be to be able to have that autonomy, mm-hmm. to be able to make those thoughts and decisions yourself. There's no right way to work out. There is no right way to eat. The way that you work out best is the way that you're going to have the best response relative to your health and your goals. Same thing with nutrition. The diet that works best for you, that's the diet you do. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. When you start make, trying to market things, you start marketing working out ideas and say, oh, everyone has to do P90X. It's the best. Mm-hmm. Everyone has to do 5x5 five five or 5-3-1 or CrossFit or whatever the flavor of the day is. Right. The truth is, some people will respond well to those things and some people won't. And same thing with nutrition. Some people may respond well to certain aspects of a paleolithic diet, whatever that means. It's still theoretical at this point. And some people might respond well to a very low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet. Mm -hmm. But to say one is always going to be the best or one is always going to be the worst, it really removes that critical thinking component. And I think that's where a lot of people, it's very comforting to say, this expert said X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But to really think about it yourself and analyze how you're responding, how you're feeling, are you getting where you want to go? That's the tool set that I think a lot of people have a hard time accepting because to be healthy, it's kind of a responsibility. Yes. I mean, no one's going to spoon feed you. I'm right. sorry. If you have that luxury, great. But if you don't, you have to make those decisions. And it can be taxing to make decisions based on reflection and as Ray Pete often says, perceive, thinking, and acting. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that goes back to the inner, like the energy expenditure that you just that you talked about earlier. If you don't have that energy to put into the critical thinking or figuring it out or learning more about it, then you're probably most likely going to just do what someone tells you to do because that's what's the easiest thing to do. So, well, we've been programmed a long time ago, you know, from not not to be, you know. Um, wrong that our parents tell us what to do. It's a safety mechanism to help us not know, when we're not knowing what we're doing and we're growing up. But as we've grown through we're this... Wrong, yeah. Huh? What? My parents were wrong, though. <laughs> yes, they're all... You know, all parents are wrong and they're all parents are right at times. But what we're really looking at is that growth within ourselves as you decide to go out into the world, letting go of that, like, fear of taking responsibility like responsibility of self means that you care for self like you you don't have to have everything perfect you don't have to have everything um, organized you know it's messy job out there and and you're not going to break yourself most people are really afraid to try something and see if it works anymore the 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 scientists or the experimenter in ourselves has been kind of pushed behind when we're kids we're going to try you know going down the hill on a bicycle or something and maybe that wasn't the best of ideas but then maybe trying an orange juice may not have been such a bad idea if it made you feel good and these are little decisions that we have to kind of fine tune within ourselves to be able to say you know what I can do this and I won't fall apart. <laughs> you know, there's a little right. bit of that. Like you can yeah. take the, the safety wheels off for now. You, you can put them back a little later if you need them. But right now, just be okay with experimenting. Yeah. And I think that we have all the answers at this point. I mean, it wasn't very long ago. You could walk into a pharmacy and you could buy morphine without a prescription. Right. You wow. could be able to go to the tonsorial parlor or your, what is now known as your barber shop, and if you were sick, they would let blood out of you to try and get rid of the toxins. This was not very long ago, and so to think that we've completely figured out the right way to eat, the right way to be healthy, the right way to live forever, we haven't. No. Yeah, so and I feel like in some ways we've all even gone backwards, yeah. you know, in, in a, a lot of ways. Well, yeah. more information always, you know, seems like a great idea, but then it sometimes it's not filtrated right, and or in not right, but in it filtrated like in just a plain kind of integration of can I take this information that I'm receiving and do utilize it in my life, which is a really important decision making, and, and you know, and how we all need to have, you know, that ability to do that thing, you know, is that part of us that needs to grow within. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, everybody. Four Sigmatic is on a mission to popularizing mushroom consumption. 
They make drinking mushrooms and superfoods delicious and easy to do with their mushroom coffees, mushroom superfood blends, and mushroom elixirs. They sell tens for at-home use and single-serve packets, which are convenient to carry and share. So you'll love blending their products with a cup of hot water and some milk or mixing them into your smoothies and shakes. But the bottom line is that they believe life is better when we're on shrooms every day, all day. And again, we have talked about mushrooms in the past and how it can be a detoxifying aid for the gut and the liver. And that's why I add mine to my milk every morning, as well as um, in the form of the hot cacao mix, as that's my favorite. Um, You get a good source of magnesium from the cacao, as well as there's some sugar in there for metabolism. And then the mushrooms uh, give you that detoxifying effect for the liver and support, help to the liver to support function, as well as your gut. It helps to eliminate endotoxins in the gut, much like the carrot does. So this is why I really love this product. I've been using it for some time now and I'm really loving it. So if you guys want to go to, if you want to order for Sigmatic, if you want to support this podcast, you can actually go through our affiliate link and you can use our code integrate yourself to receive 10% off and a little bit comes back to us our show and our production costs so thanks everybody and now back to the show so let's talk about the wrong kind of diet let's start with keto (laughs) (laughs) oh you kind of know that huh yeah so for me i (laughs) it would have made perfect sense when it was presented to me as an idea and I was going through a lot of health issues and I had gravitated towards a paleo diet at the time, my understanding of that. And I'm not the type of person to kind of just test the water. If I'm going to get into something, I'm going to get into something. And so for me, I bought Lauren Cordain's book. I bought uh, all sorts of books about it. They're all packed up right now because I'm getting ready to move. But what was it that, that really appealed to you about it when you first heard about it? What was the, what was the fascination? Losing weight? Um, was it um, getting strong? What, 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 what was that for you in terms of um, why you were going to jump in full, both feet? So for me, I had started dating a gal who I'm actually going to be marrying here in a few months. Congratulations. And Congratulations. Thank you. And at the time, she had a very strong gluten sensitivity. We fixed that with Ray Pete stuff. Mm. But at the time, being very gluten sensitive, well, I really was kind of smitten by this gal, so I wanted to spend more time with her. And so what I decided to do was change my diet to help accommodate her diet so it would be easier for us to spend time together. So I went gluten-free. And then I'm also the type that says, well, if gluten-free is good, more is better. (laughs) So I went (laughs) grain-free. And looking into paleo, oh, well, this is grain-free. Well, and these cavemen, they were all jacked, apparently. So I want to be that. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and go paleo. <laughs> and so I did that. And then I saw some changes in my body composition. I lost some weight. I lost some body fat. I also lost some muscle. But I noticed that I eventually started losing sleep. And I stopped seeing a change in body fat loss. And I stopped being able to grow muscle very easily. And so following a lot of podcasts, following a lot of articles, reading a lot of books, one of the recurrent themes that seemed to come up was this idea that carbohydrates were causing so many problems. They were the bane of our existence. Mm. So I decided that ketogenic was a much safer and healthier way to go because there's very little to no carbohydrate intake in there. So I decided to venture into that realm. So I started putting butter and coconut oil in my coffee, and it was disgusting. I don't. <laughs> it was way too rich and way too decadent, and a ton of calories. Mm. And presented with the idea that carbohydrates were the problem, not calories, I didn't seem to pay any mind to that. So eating a lot of steaks, eating a lot of pufa, eating a lot of nuts and seeds, and all sorts of other very fattening and high calorie foods, I started to see a little bit of change in my body composition, but then it stalled and my attitude and my social interactions with others got very, very stressful. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of social anxiety. I was very short with people. I had a lot of 
a seemingly sense of superiority because I was keto and you weren't. You're eating carbs. Mm. You must not know it. <laughs> so I decided at that point that um, I was better than the world. But I couldn't shake these carbohydrate cravings. So I started doing weird things like carb night and carb backloading and all this other stuff because the idea was still that carbohydrates are the problem. So yeah. adding in intermittent fasting, adding in the uh, high intake of fish oil, adding in the uh, cold thermogenic uh, exposure, I was getting to a point where I, would, I was able to go for a walk with my dog for an hour or more in Colorado winters wearing nothing but gym shorts and sandals. Okay? Wow. Wow. I have that level of cold tolerance. And did I see any changes? No, nothing beneficial. I saw a continual progression of a worsening of the symptoms I'd been dealing with for years. Wow. I started to see hair loss. I started to see worse libido. I started to see worse social interactions. And at that point, that's when I started looking into kettlebell training and doing stuff at home because I didn't want to be around other people. Wow. And that's what prompted me to find Z Health. And thankfully I did because now I have a lot more social tolerance of people, even the ones I don't like. And so at that point, I came to realize that maybe there's not a one size fits all approach. And so the ketogenic experiment that I ran, I did that for about a year and a half. And that was very, very taxing and trying. And it was very hard to do. Um, going out to restaurants becomes a chore, going to people's houses becomes a chore. Not being a prick to people becomes a chore. <laughs> so, so at that point, um, looking back, there was a lot of reasons that I saw the changes I saw, saw the progress that I saw, and then why I eventually stopped seeing progress. And through understanding more about biochemistry and through understanding more about how glucose is actually utilized in the body and what situations would, in nature, cause ketosis to show up, a lot of things started to make more sense. So with ketosis, one of the things I think a lot of people miss is that as far as long-term human studies are concerned, there's not a lot. And, and the ones that there are are primarily on epileptics. Mm. And so when you're looking at that from a health standpoint, that's a very particular population. Yep. Then when people extrapolate that out and say everyone should do it and it's superior to everything, well, that's when we got to start saying, well, pump the brakes. Maybe it's not. And when we start looking at why things like that might work in epilepsy, there's a lot of things that we need to kind of understand about ketosis and how it really works. So the biggest thing that I've noticed in my research about it is there's basically three mechanisms of action that cause it to be very positive in helping people. That's right. It can help people, but there's a reason why. And I think that there's safer and easier ways to go about addressing those problems or creating those changes without the cost of increasing your stress hormones. So reason one is it spares NAD. NAD is a huge cellular precursor to all sorts of energy functions in the cell. And so when you have more of that, you have an increase in your NAD to NADH ratio. And that's a really key marker that a lot of people are looking at in research right now as far as disease prevention and overall health and metabolic function. But ketosis tends to spare that. Ketosis being a fat-based uh, metabolic pathway, it's really handy to have when you have an absence of food. When you're facing starvation and death, it's really nice to have this system in place to create a minimal amount of glucose through gluconeogenesis and to utilize fat as energy in creating ketones. That process requires half as much thiamine as glucose does. So thiamine is B1. B1 is necessary for an enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase. So pyruvate dehydrogenase helps you to utilize more glucose more deeply and get more ATP out of it. If you don't have a lot of thiamine, then you're going to have a problem utilizing glucose well. Why people might respond well to a ketogenic diet would be that they don't have enough thiamine to utilize glucose well. So they're actually favoring this choice that will allow them to spare the nutrients that they're already short in. Mm. 
so that's one other. That's the second reason. That's so really it, interesting. So it just yeah. helps helps them at the purpose of what they cannot do. So the reason they already had a function at dysfunction, and now they're just helping that keep from having stress on their bodies. They keep following that diet. Is that what you're kind of saying in some ways? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So, number three. Go right ahead. Yeah. Number three is one of the things that. Uh, ketosis does is it spares um, or it helps to perpetuate the production of a neuroprotective steroid called allopregnanolone. Allopregnanolone is derived from progesterone. Mm -hmm. So why that might be important is because that's a very calming, very uh, anti-excitotoxic hormone, if you will. So in epileptics, it helps to calm the brain. So when people say, I feel great on ketosis, I'm sure you do. But can we create allopregnanolone by other means that don't require creating a shortage of glucose? Can we create allopregnanolone in ways that don't require us to not utilize glucose well or to have a shortage of thiamine? Yeah. And a lot of that is done by removing polyunsaturated fats. Mm. Polyunsaturated fats will contribute to blocking the production of progesterone. And if you don't have enough progesterone, you can't produce allopregnanolone. So when a lot of people talk about, I feel great when I cut out carbohydrates, maybe the problem is not the carbohydrate. Maybe the problem is the, in the context that you're introducing carbohydrates into. So can we remove PUFA and increase allopregnolone production? Yeah. Can you increase your B vitamin intake so that you can utilize glucose better? Yeah. So maybe I don't need to drop my glucose levels so low that I've created this response that mimics starvation. Maybe I can improve the way I utilize glucose. Maybe I can improve the way that I utilize my hormone pathways. Yeah. That's, that's a great summation of what, I love what, that. what people really need to hear about why you may not want to choose that diet. What about a number four? What about the carbon dioxide and whether or not you're creating enough in your system? Yeah, so that was another uh, interesting thought process of Jack Cruz is that nitric oxide is so valuable. Well, it is if you're not producing carbon dioxide. Nitric oxide uh -huh. on a base level is a, va a vasodilator. It helps with circulation. It helps with blood flow. The problem is that when nitric oxide attaches to key respiratory enzymes in the cell, you have a downside to energy production. Right. You're not able to create as much ATP. So nitric oxide attaches to an enzyme called cytochrome C oxidase. So cytochrome C oxidase helps you get into deeper levels of cellular respiration. And when that's blocked, again, you're going to limit your capacity to utilize glucose well. So carbon dioxide, which is produced by carbohydrates, so that's where the name actually comes from, is carbo, carbon, hydrates, and water. So it's carbon and water in the molecule basis. So when you have a shortage of carbohydrate intake, you will produce less carbon dioxide. And so carbon dioxide will act as a vasodilator. The thing is, carbon dioxide does not interfere with cellular respiration negatively. It actually promotes it. Right. So when you have a state where you're creating better CO2 production, you're able to get more out of glucose. So it's one of these weird situations where on the extreme ends of the spectrum, really low carbohydrate or really high carbohydrate, low fat, you're going to see these weird metabolic changes occur. Where people run into issues is this kind of middle ground where a lot of times you don't see these weird mitochondrial uncoupling effects. You don't see a lot of these really upregulated Randall cycle effects where you start utilizing glucose really well. And that's where you can have a lot more room for error, I believe. Mm. Because if you have fat, your cells can't utilize glucose well. And if you have too much glucose, you're not going to utilize fat very well. Your cells are going to prefer one or the other. But if utilizing fat predominantly comes at the cost of lower carbon dioxide, increased nitric oxide, and mimicking a state of stress, I don't think that's something we'd want to dabble with long term. Yeah, very good. I agree. Very yeah. good. And, and one of the things that I noticed is the transition back from those diets to a carbohydrate diet or to a, the, the, the fear that comes in with some of the clients that I've talked to is about gain weight, 
the whole aspect of you don't know what your healing time is. And if there is a healing time, what it mainly is, is that when you transition, like in your, your case, you experience absolute change right when you did it. That one day of drinking Coke and orange juice and some people are not as, as aware. Can you talk a little bit about what you do to talk to people about maybe look at the options in a different way? What, what do you kind of tell them? Well, I think you just nailed a key component of it, and that's options. The word options is so important because somebody might just be able to supplement with B1 and alleviate so many problems when they start introducing glucose back in. Sometimes people have other issues where they have to really deal with stress on a different level than just providing more sugar. And as much as sugar is a huge anti-stress component, as most stress hormones are designed specifically to create sugar from your own tissues through a process called involution, getting to that point where somebody has better neural tone in their brainstem to regulate stress and sympathetic parasympathetic balance might be what they're really missing a lot of because that would change blood flow to the gut and that would change nutrient absorption. Mm. You might have an issue where you have people that they need a lot of fat-soluble vitamins so that they can start creating more uh, pregnenolone from their cholesterol. You might have somebody who needs to go after a lot of the cofactors for thyroid production. They might be low in protein. There's a lot of things that somebody might need to get more out of what they're doing. So when you talk about it, or when I talk about it, I talk to them about it from the standpoint of, we're going to experiment, and we're going to look for these positive changes. So usually it's a matter of looking at things subjectively, looking at their specific goals. Oh, I want to look good in a bikini. Well, who doesn't? Oh, I want to feel good when I wake up in the morning. Oh, I want to sleep better. Oh, I want my hair to stop falling out. Oh, I don't want my PMS cramps to be so bad. Cool. We can work on any one of those things or all of them. We just need to have a good, clear goal. Mm. So when you have those kind of endpoints, you can start looking at it and saying, are we seeing changes that we want to see? Are we seeing things that tell us we're on the right trajectory? Because yeah. after a certain point, you're going to do things and not see a change. That doesn't mean that it didn't work. It just means that that's a box we can tick as something that gives us information. So the same thing with movement, same thing with exercise. If I do a wrist circle and my back pain's still there, it doesn't mean the wrist circle didn't work. It just means that wasn't the drill for you. Right. Yeah. I like that. So same thing with nutrition. If we do something that we know is going to put us in the right direction, in the right wheelhouse, and we don't see a negative response and we don't see a positive response, that doesn't mean that we stop doing it. It just means, okay, right. cool. that wasn't the thing you're missing. Yeah, I, I, I think that is a great, great analogy because you, know, you think about people bringing back carbohydrates. A lot of times people think of carbohydrates as pasta and bread too or starchy kinds of carbohydrates that aren't going to be really good for you or easy to digest. And then some people might try to go crazy with the sugar, you know, and just drink Coke or, some, or something like that. And that might be too much too soon or maybe they don't need that kind of sugar you know in the first place so you know and I think that's where things kind of have gone wrong a little bit with the repeat some of the repeat nutrition and people involved in that it, the extreme and um, the complexities of of it all and what people people make it so complex and it's just about really missing nutrients is what it comes down to you know like what are you missing in your diet, what do you need? And and your sympt I, I think symptoms can tell you a lot about what you're missing. Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> so yeah. one of the things that I found fascinating when I met you, Brian, was the um, passion that you have with PubMed, that your ability to take um, all those uh, great articles and share <laughs> them on forums with people. And I mean, you find some really good ones. Um, they've been quite helpful uh, for me. And um, I want to, want to talk a little bit about what is your passion about that? What, what, what really fires you about the research? Because we know there's a dogma. We know that, you know, it's yeah. biased on some levels. Like you, you can have research that's been contained in one area and, and, and look like it's a good thing. And then, you know, who's paying for it, all these issues. But what do you – tell us a little bit about your passion about that. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of bias out there. And that's where you can have a lot of different interpretations of the same data set depending on the person. 
So Carl C. Lindgren, he wrote a really cool book. It's hard to come by anymore, but it's called Cold War in Biology. It was written back in the 60s. I tried to find um, that. I couldn't yeah. find it. Yeah. Keep looking because it's worth it. And he has a paragraph <laughs> in there where he says that it's really important to know if the, ins if the scientists that are performing the study are atheists, agnostic, or men of faith, whether they're Democrats, Republicans, whatever their political leaning is, that matters, not because it will change the information or the data, but it may change how they interpret it. So wow, one of the that's things great. that, yeah. But yeah, that when I read that, that really stuck with me. And so um, from there, whenever I try and read a study, whether it's stuff that says PUFA is awesome or it's stuff that says PUFA is terrible, I always try and frame it from the perspective of, well, what's their goal or what is their view on physiology? So one of the things that really stands out with the Ray Pete perspective is that it's not so much about just being alive and surviving. It's about yeah. creating a metabolic state in which you can be a lot more resilient. And in our modern day and age, we have a lot more stressors that we're presented with. Toxic water, toxic air, EMF, whatever, you name it, we're not going to get rid of that stuff anytime soon. But if we can bolster ourselves from an energetic perspective, we have a lot more resources at our disposal to deal with those stressors. Mm -hmm. So looking at research, it's very important to think about it from the idea of, are they talking about this or are they looking at this from that perspective? Or are they looking at it from a perspective that says, well, they're alive, therefore, you must be okay. Because one of the things that you'll yeah. see a lot in looking at things like PUFA, because PUFA has a strong anti-metabolic effect. Because as you increase some of those hormones like progesterone, progesterone increases glucose utilization. So as you increase your metabolic production by the hormone pathways you stimulate, that's going to increase your fuel needs. So when you take in things like polyunsaturated fats that block some of those productions or hormone pathways and you block progesterone production, it now makes it easier to meet metabolic needs. Mm. So when people say, Oh, I ate this fish oil and yeah. inflammation went down and all these problems went away. Yeah, because you lowered the cost to be alive. Right. But does that mean that you're going to down the road have problems or does yeah. that mean that have other issues in the brain? Things like lipofuse skin and acrolein? Right. Things that are byproducts of fish oil and polyunsaturated fats? You might. So you're going to change your cost now for the cost later. And because the human body is designed for survival not longevity, it will always shine on the side of, I will get better right now because I don't care about the future. Right. And That's such a great way to put it. I just, I, that was excellent. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> You're welcome. we've talked about this issue with uh, mindsets of, you know, short term versus long term and, uh, you know, why that is an issue because a lot of people tend to go into this idea that, you know, it's, it's worth that one moment where I put myself into this dress for this wedding. Uh, um, I don't care about anything else. I want to make sure I'm as good looking as I possibly can in that one little moment. But we have no idea what trails we have left for the aging to quicken, the longevity to shorten, and our our passion to be distinguished because we're fatigued because our body has increased its stress hormones. And it, it comes over and over again about the confusion of whether it is worth the decision that you're making at this time. And that is, is very subjective, but it is also emotional. So when you talk about these passion to look at the science, it really brings up, you know, more of why people may want to look into the longevity of things because, you know, it, it, at least in my perspective. Yeah, and that's, it's one of those big talking points I have with people when we talk about things like carbohydrates and diabetes because there's this really pervasive idea right now that insulin causes glycation and that carbohydrates are the cause of diabetes. Mm. And a lot of that comes back to, I think, just this irrational fear of carbohydrates. But the same idea applies that you have to think long term because insulin in and of itself helps to get rid of glycated end products. So when you're seeing these weird, the only human study I know of on advanced glycation end products in humans was looking at the effects of diet on that. And they took a group and they said, hey, here's the Atkins diet book. Read this and follow what's in it. Now we're going to measure your before and after uh, methylglyoxal levels. 
which is one of the key glycation end products they look at. And they took that group and they looked at them and they saw, and they took a control group and said, just keep doing what you're doing. We're going to measure you all the same. And afterwards, they revisited uh, uh, them, measured them again, and saw that the Atkins group, lower carbohydrate intake, had a higher glycation end product level. And there's a lot of reasons for that. It's because insulin stimulates an enzyme called glyoxylase, which helps to break down methylglyoxal. Mm. So it's one of those things where when you start looking at it, it's like, well, maybe what you're seeing is this decrease in blood sugar. So you're looking at a change in your hemoglobin A1C, but that's short term. Because long term, you're going to have all these other things that might affect you. And insulin is very protective. Insulin stimulates glutathione. Right. So if you're thinking in terms right. of redox status and your overall cellular detox processes, you might need insulin. <laughs> which That's is, a good point. Which is yeah. one of the debates about whether or not someone can produce insulin. And in diabetes is, is yeah. the big talk about, you know, why it became an issue and why it became a um, solution to start injecting insulin instead of just maybe looking at maybe the person isn't metabolizing the sugar correctly or something else is inhibiting it where you know this gets into a bigger discussion because it is quite mass produced to keep people afraid of sugars especially fresh fruits and stuff like that when you're diabetic but it is it is amazing that the one cure for a, a, someone having a diabetic uh, episode is to give them orange juice like that is yeah. what they say to give, you know, uh, instantaneously. And as know. long as I can remember, that's how it's been. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I remember <laughs> one of my first introductions to somebody with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, insulin dependent, but type 2, um, was that when their blood sugar was low and they were going into this diabetic shock state, they would drink a Mountain Dew or they would drink orange juice. And that always stuck with me. I thought, well, why would you want that? Because you're yeah. you're going to need more um, insulin to deal with that. But what I come to realize later is because fructose doesn't require insulin to enter the cell. Right. It was yeah. very easy for them to get the uh, benefits of cellular energy production without worrying about their insulin at the time. Right. And knowing that and understanding that later on, a lot of things made more sense. But it's yeah. it's one of those things where if we remove the sugar from the diet you'll see a change in your blood sugar readings. So if we only look at blood sugar as the cause of diabetes, then yeah, you're going to see changes. So when people have problems transitioning from a ketogenic diet back to one that includes carbohydrates, and they say, well, my blood sugar is really, really high, or I feel really poor when I do that. I can't do that anymore. I'm not tolerant to carbohydrates. I'm carbohydrate intolerant. Or they go to the doctor and they get uh, tested after being stressed at a, being at a doctor's office for two hours anyways. But, you know, the whole idea of checking right. your blood sugar has in keeping these people under these ideas that, oh, your blood sugar is too high. You you must reduce your sugar intake. And yet, I'll let you continue. Yeah. But that that <laughs> is insanity and it's, it's finest well, because you were already competing with the stress hormones that are already produced in the body. Like it is insanity. And those stress yeah. hormones specifically raise blood sugar. Adrenaline raises yeah. blood sugar. Yeah. Cortisol raises blood sugar. <laughs> Thyroid hormone raises blood sugar. So when you're looking at these things and saying, <laughs> hey, I have high blood sugar, you have to look at all these other factors. Right. And when you yeah. only fixate myopically on the one marker or the one reading, you're going to see a lot of people infer way too many things that they shouldn't be off of that one data point. Right. And so diabetes, you're looking at these people transitioning and having these problems with carbohydrates and only measuring their blood glucose, they're going to appear as if they're having these weird adverse reactions. But if you just went from a high fat diet to one that has more carbohydrates, you might have a problem not because of the carbohydrate, but because again, back to the Randall cycle, you might have too much fat to utilize that glucose well. Right. And then you're in, the, in this weird metabolic purgatory where if you're not providing good nutrition, you're not providing the nutrients you're missing, and you're not getting enough glucose to utilize that favorably in the cell, you're going to be starved for energy and you're going to perpetuate this cycle where your cells just can't absorb anything up to a certain point, and then you're going to be able to present yourself as a diabetic. Mm -hmm. right. That's not going to be. Or any other disease, autoimmune, any kind of problems with um, um, 
uh, you know, dementia. Uh, yeah, any kind of Alzheimer's. Um, yeah, any of the nerve, like the uh, MS uh, and those kinds of things as well, because that's a starved for energy state, in my opinion, for sure. Oh, absolutely is. Absolutely is. Which is also yeah. yeah. Which we talked about the nerve nerve endings and how they are affected with MS. And you know, if you're really depriving yourself <laughs> from energy, you know, the body is, is adapting to that survival mechanism. And if we're looking at what it's going to say first, it's going to start taking away what it can to keep you breathing and your heart beating. And so, you know, these things start to change and you can't move as well. And um, it's it's fascinating. It, it, it's it, it's fascinating that the information is is unraveling, but still people have such problems understanding it. So we appreciate you talking about it today because you have a wealth of knowledge that is very um, helpful, yes. and the way you explain it is perfect in my opinion too. So wanted to ask a couple of other questions real quick. What do you have on the horizon for yourself? Um, I know you're moving. You have a new website coming out. So uh, give us a little input about what's going on for you next. Sure. So I'm moving to Denver. I will be there by the end of this month and by the end of March here and uh, pairing up with another Z Health practitioner. And uh, our goal is to really get together and really drive a lot of brain-based and metabolically-based changes for people. And uh, the website that I'm working on, uh, it's, I'm having somebody work on it, and uh, it's in the process of being completed. So that'll be up and running soon. It'll be at performanceneuro.com. So I'm, but I want to say thank you to you guys. I appreciate that there's somebody else out there talking about this stuff. And you guys have such a wonderful platform to share your wealth of knowledge and to be able to communicate with so many people with this information. I think it's super important, and I think what you guys are doing is super awesome. Thank, oh, thank you. you so much. <laughs> I really appreciate that. That's yeah. great to hear. Yeah. And yeah, I, I really feel like getting connected with Zachariah and you, Brian, has been really great because it's nice to have people in your group or whatever you want to call it in the, you know, on the same page and in a similar mindset, because this is not like conventional wisdom, right? It's, it's very, controversial in some ways. So it's good to have people that know the science behind what we're talking about as well and can come on the show and talk about it. So we appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's funny when I started working with Zachariah, he's taught me, I'd say 95% of what I know at this point. Mm. And um, what's really cool is that when you have that mindset, you find people that share that with you. So if any of your listeners are worried that adopting these ideas or experimenting with them is so hard because your family may not be on board or your friends may not understand, there's plenty of people out there in either Reiki communities or other communities where you can share these ideas and you can share your data points and your experimentation and you can talk about a lot of what you're dealing with and working towards. So please yeah. have that hope. And there is a forum that you uh, uh, and Zechariah have called Mirandering 101. Um, so if anybody wants to just delve into learning a little bit more, um, you can check that out. You can also yeah. come to It's our, on Facebook. Yeah, it's on Facebook. On Facebook. And yep. uh, Integrate Yourself Community um, is also on Facebook. And we're welcoming any listeners to come on and you, know, you can yeah. um, meet up with Brian or Zachariah. They're on that too. Um Anything else, Allison? You got any other questions? No, I think we covered so much great stuff. That was so fantastic. Thanks, Brian. So, when you're yeah. established in Denver, will we come back on the show and um, maybe show your facility and talk a little bit more about something else um, if you're open to that? I'd love to. I'd be awesome. honored. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. Well, good luck with your move, Brian. And um, Thank you very much. Yeah. I am. I'm looking forward to it. And congratulations again. Um, yes. Congratulations on your and... new journey. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and she's put up with me through all this. When we started with the whole gluten-free thing, experimented and experimented, and every time we'd reintroduce gluten, she'd have a problem. Wow. And that made the biggest difference for her. Whenever she'd have gluten, we would introduce a lot of sugar and progesterone and vitamin E at the same time. Wow. So addressing from that perspective... She can now eat pizza. So now she, she can, can eat gluten. Bread. She wow. can eat sandwiches. 
we were out and visiting her family. She's eating a sandwich, and they looked at her, and they said, well, you can't have that. What about the gluten? She's like, oh, no, Brian fixed me. Wow. So there's a lot of things that you can do <laughs> that yeah. can improve your health in ways that you may not realize are yeah. even an option. So yeah, that's once so again, great because I know I heard that, you know, uh, I want to just say, say one thing about that because that reminded me of something I heard from Ray Pete about estrogen and it, how if your estrogen can make the gut more sensitive to gluten, actually. Mm. So if, you, if you're not, if you're recirculating it <clears throat> in the gut and not detoxifying it, that's why I think it makes so much sense, actually, because if you think about why so many people all of a sudden are now sensitive to gluten, it, it, it has to do with the gluten gluten itself, of course, in the quality of it, but also it, it much has to do with estrogen, how we are really estrogen dominant as a society with all the stress that we have to go through in life. So um, it makes sense. Between the stress, the plastics and everything that we're yeah. exposed to, there's no way around it. But again, yeah. that's part of the reason that I think it's super important that you bolster yourself metabolically against all those things. Absolutely. And to yeah. learn what is specific to you. So for your wife, or I'm going to call her what your wife because you are mismarried, <laughs> um, you know, that works for her. And, um, you know, and, and to start something slowly, the biggest part of any of this journey is to recognize that, you know, taking bits and pieces at a small pay, pace, being a little bit patient um, will be the, the keys that you'll need a little bit more to understanding why this worked for you. And, um, so, um, you know, we don't want to give anybody the idea that everything works for everyone. We just want you to make sure you become your own authority. Yeah. Right. And it's, and you touched on a key point there. I think you have to understand at least some modicum of what's happening, whether you get to the right. nitty gritty of these enzymes are controlled by these. You don't need to know that level of detail per se to know that something you're doing isn't helping you. Yes. Or that right. something you're doing is helping you. But to give yourself that permission to say, I can be in charge of what I determine is right for me or not. It's like when I talk to people about stretching, if you need to stretch, if you feel like you're tight, and they say, I need to go to a yoga class to loosen up. Well, do you like yoga? <laughs> no. Well, then don't do that. Do other stuff. But if you like yoga, then it's great for you. But there's plenty of ways to increase how flexible you are. Yeah. And I actually got that quote from Zachariah. <laughs> but <laughs> I love it. It's so pertinent because it's yeah. one of those ideas that you have so many options. You don't have to do something because somebody else says so. Yes. You can do it entirely because it's intuitive. You can do it entirely because it makes sense to you on an emotional level or a physical level or whatever. But do yourself the honor of giving yourself the internal feedback to say, I feel good or I don't with what I'm doing, or I need more information, or I need to try something else. Yeah, yeah. perfect. And then uh, and also knowing that you can change. You can, you know, one moment you may like yoga, one moment you don't. It's okay, you know? It's yeah. absolutely okay to have a diversity of movement and, you know, and be okay with, you know, whatever emotions come up when you're doing it. It's a, it's that part of the you that needs to ex keep exploring because it's that part of you that wants to say, oh, this is boring, or I've done this, I'm so good at this, I don't want to do this anymore. And that's just kind of making you boxed in because you don't really see that there's other options still in the, within what you're doing. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So once again, Brian, wonderful time spent. Yeah. I mean, I really appreciate your knowledge and keep forefront with this, with what you know and, you know, sharing because you've got the ability and the passion and it's really great to see how, um, friendly you are. I don't know how you were back then, but to meet you now, <laughs> I've had so Probably much. Probably wouldn't have liked me much. I didn't like me much. <laughs> Um, I'm always excited to see you at the Z Health events and um, uh, uh, and the sh courses. So hopefully I'll see you again, and we'll bring Allison yeah. one and one of those days to. I will. I'll hook, come. Hook up. I'll come. Yeah. So. Um... <laughs> Good. I can't wait. That'll be great. <laughs> All right then. All well, right. Well, thanks, uh, Brian. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you guys. We'll I talk really to... appreciate it. All right. Bye bye. Take care.